morning, this is about the Lord's Supper. The Last Supper, when Jesus was his, with his disciples, they were going to eat the Passover. And Jesus told his disciples, go into the city and you will find a man and tell him that we would like to come to his house for Passover. Passover happened before the Lord's Supper. And Jesus changed it from Passover to the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> so what was the Feast of Unleavened Bread? What was Passover? You remember? The angel passed over and didn't kill the people that had the blood on the door. Okay? You remember that. Okay? And unleavened bread means it was like a tortilla. I meant to bring a tortilla this morning, but I didn't do that because it didn't have leaven in it, okay? And the Jews celebrated Passover ever since the time of Moses when the Lord saved all the Israelite babies. And this was when the Lord's passed over their houses and they were kept safe if they had the blood on the doorpost. And during the Passover celebration, people didn't eat or have any bread in their homes that had yeast in it. Yeast is what makes it rise. Okay? Maybe some of your parents have made bread and they put yeast in it and that's what makes it rise so it doesn't stay flat. Okay? And the disciples did just as Jesus asked. They went into town and they found the place and they got ready for the Passover. And when the evening came, Jesus and the disciples sat down and they had a meal together. Okay? They had the Passover meal. And the disciples were eating quietly because they had a lot on their minds. They were worried. Some people wanted to kill Jesus. And that's part of what this represents. Okay? And they were worried that some would try to kill Jesus since he was getting so popular. And Jesus could see the disciples were worried. So he said to them quietly, I'll tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. And the disciples all said, who? Oh, is it me? Is it me? All of the disciples kept asking, is it me? Is it me? And Jesus finally said, it's the one that's going to dip his bread the same time I do. And Judas said, is it me? And Jesus said, yes, it's you. And he hoped nobody else heard. And then Jesus said, <clears throat> shared the bread took the cup and thanked God for it. He said, this is my blood, which be poured out for many, for their sins to be forgiven. They all took a sip from the cup. The meal continued. It was a long celebration. The disciples took their time because they enjoyed talking with Jesus and asking him questions. And just like when you go, at home and you like to ask questions and parents ask you questions. And after some time, Jesus got up from the table, went to another room, and he took off his, his everyday clothes and put a large towel around himself like he was going to be a servant. And after that, he poured water into a large bowl and began to wash the disciples' feet. And then he dried them with the towel that he had wrapped around him. And Jesus was king. But even greater than the king, he's the king of kings. And by washing the disciples' he was feet, he was doing something that only servants usually did. But Jesus being the king of kings, he was doing it for his disciples. And when it was Peter's turn, he says, not my feet. You're not going to touch my feet. Jesus said, so if I can't wash your feet, then you have no part with me. And 
And then Peter says, well, then not uh, just my feet, my whole body. She said, no, just your feet. That's all that's necessary. And when Jesus had finished washing all the disciples' feet, he put his everyday clothes back on and returned to the table. He said, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and I am. And now that I've washed your feet, you can also wash one another's feet. And that is an example of how we are to treat others. You don't actually have to wash other people's feet, but do nice things for others is what Jesus asked us to do. How many can do nice things for others? Amen. You can take your seats. Amen? So let me open with prayer. Loving Father, we ask that you might touch each heart here. Help us to remember that we are part of the body. We are the body of Christ. And as part of the body, we need to work in unity. For we ask that you might bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you have noticed that the devil's trying to break us up? Have you noticed that? He's trying to break us up in all kinds of ways. Mask, no mask. Vax, no vaxed. Okay? Wrong color, wrong ethnic group, all kinds of things are happening. The devil is trying to divide us. Are you hearing me this morning? God calls us to be one in him, to work together. Okay? Our first text is found in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 14. It says, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves, free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. And then down to verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ. Yet we are members individually. God calls us to work together to accomplish great things for him. But we need one another. Amen? And just as the cells of our body are mutually dependent upon one another for continued health, so also, as the members of the spiritual body of Christ, we are mutually dependent on one another for spiritual health. And just as each human cell works for the benefit of the body as a whole, so we are to work in unity for the benefit of the church, the spiritual body of Christ. And if each one of us work for the church, the body of Christ, in an unselfish manner and help one another, the church will continue to be healthy. But if we each do it in a selfish way or self-serving manner, the church will become unhealthy and may even come to cease to exist. So what helps us to function in a spiritual, healthy manner? First of all, we need to be born again every day. Are you hearing me? That's an everyday experience. And if it's not every day, there's a problem. John 3.3 3 says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You remember that. And if we're not born again daily, we can't do God's work and be a blessing to God and to others. 
Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I want you to think about this for a moment. We need to let him live in us daily. That means we put away our desires and the things that we want and let him do the living in us. That's what Paul is talking about here. Numbers 2. We must be born again to be successful and effective for God and his church. That's why God, Jesus told his disciples that they needed to wait for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, even though they had been with him for three and a half years. You might be with Jesus for 20 years, but if you're not with him today, it's a problem. Acts 1, 4, 5, and 8 says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. What was the promise? The Holy Spirit. Which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with what? Not many days from now. <clears throat> And verse 8 goes on to say, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. In that story I just read about the tithing, the GPS, God's provision of service, <laughs> was working that day and took them off the interstate to feed somebody and bring them back on. God has appointments for you and me as well. He wants to use us as part of his body. <clears throat> and it's to Roswell and Dexter and Artesia, wherever. And it's through the Holy Spirit that Jesus lives most fully in our lives. Jesus told the disciples, John 14, 16 through 18 and 20, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. Did you catch that? The world cannot receive, but only those asking for the Holy Spirit because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him, for he dwells in you and will be in you. That's what we need. We need the Holy Spirit in us. Amen? And I like this next part. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. And at that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Jesus and the Father live in the believer through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that the only way we can truly serve God in the body of Christ and be most beneficial and unselfish in a loving manner is to be led by the Spirit. And when we're led by the Spirit, Galatians tells us in 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such there is no law. For when we have the fruit of the Spirit, it shows up in our love, in our life. And it will show all that we have Jesus in our heart. I took this next one from 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, from today's Living Bible. 
because I like the little nuances it gives here. It says, love is very patient and kind. How many of you need that kind of love? Patient and kind? Never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It's not irritable or touchy. It does not hold grudges and will hardly even notice when others do it wrong. Is that needed in our lives today? There's so many divorces because we're not forgiving, we're not loving, we're, not, we're wanting our own way and, and not what God wants. Never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him no matter what the cost. You always believe in him, always respect the best for him, and always stand your ground in defending him. Forgive my sp spelling errors. I don't know what happened. If we are spirit-filled, we will have the gifts of the spirit working in our life for the benefit of the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and 7 says, it's true that there are different gifts, but the same Holy Spirit who gives them to us. God has given you gifts or will develop gifts. I've seen it over and over again in the church. My piano players moved off and all I had was a 13-year-old said, if you give me the song on Sunday, I'll, I'll know it by Sabbath. And God developed her to be the piano player till we got another piano player. God will give you the gifts. If you don't believe it, look at who's standing in front of you. I was shy and would never speak to anybody. Now you can't shut me up. God wants to develop you into whatever he needs. And he will do that. We just need to let him work. And the presence of the Holy Spirit is shown in different ways, but always for the good of the whole church. So as we partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, realize The bread also represents his church. Christ's spiritual body, as well as a physical body. We need to understand these things and desire to be filled with the Spirit each and every day, each and every moment, so we can be the greatest blessing to God and to his church, the body of Christ. How many of you desire to have the fruit of the Spirit in your life? How many? And if you do, what changes do you need to make in your life? Because we need to be growing all the time, not just standing, stagnant. Because there is no such a stagnant. Either you're going towards them or you're going away from them. But you can't stay where you are. You know, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Do you know what it means to be crucified with Christ? Do you know what it means to be dead? It means I'm dead to my desires. I'm dead to my way. I'm dead to not doing it his way. Because if you're not doing it his way, you're going the other way. Are you hearing me? That means I'm dead when somebody says something against me, I don't get upset because I'm dead. I can't. Are you hearing me? Dead people don't have desires. They're dead. Paul says, Christ lives in me. So, 
Who is in control of your life? If you're in control, then the worship is you. Paul says, I die daily. And dead people do his will. So, how many want the Holy Spirit to lead in your life? Then I want you to pray with me just now. Pray that the Holy Spirit will come in and take over. And remember that when we pray, it's the opening of the heart to him. It's not just praying. It's talking to him with all of your heart all day long. And confess, help us to confess our sins to you, Lord. And be specific so that as he forgives our sins, we are cleansed. And pray for your friends like never before. And keep praying till there's a change. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.